We'll start off with with the very afar. So we have TJ Tomlinson, who I've raced against quite a lot over the years, since around gee, early 2000s, so a little while ago. Um, but obviously TJ can give you a quick wrap into what he's done, I guess, you know, during his, everyone knows about his professional career, but I guess more so now post-career and into the future. Yeah, thanks, Luke. So, yeah, well, the first race we did together, Luke, was actually Oceanside that year that you blazed everybody. Uh, 2005? Yeah, 2006. <laughs> don't, don't know. <laughs> a long time ago. A long time ago. Um, but yeah, we've been racing together for a long time. And then, uh, you know, I started a company doing bicycle travel cases first, and that eventually morphed into what is now Diamond Bikes. And uh, Diamond Bikes started out uh, as a company. Uh, I rode an old Zip 2001 frame when I won my very first Ironman in 2011 in Lake Placid, New York. And uh, soon after that, that sparked the uh, development the prototype phase and we raced, uh, Luke was at that race. Luke actually has a history with all these races and, and the diamond. So Luke was at that race in Lake Placid, New York. Uh, then the following year, um, I rode the first prototype frame at Ironman New York City. Luke uh, has the Ironman world record for fastest swim at that race. He uh, came around me right at the end with a nice sprint. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's still in the record books, right, Luke? No, I think they got done at Chattanooga in a downstream, oh, downstream right. swim, but, you know, so was the Hudson, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so that was the first prototype I rode. And then in um, uh, 2013, or 2014, we started shipping our bikes out of our own carbon factory in Des Moines, Iowa to customers. Uh, and I won the Ironman North American Championships in 2014 in Montreal, Canada. Uh, on the diamond so Luke was there for that as well um, so yeah that's uh, it's kind of a quick brief history of what I do but uh, so I own diamond bikes I still race as a professional triathlete not at the same level that I did even a few years ago and I guess now there is no such thing as a professional triathlete right now since we don't have any races but uh, hopefully someday we'll get back to some racing and uh, in the meantime, I'm focused on the business and making the fastest bikes in the world. Yeah, and, and obviously you got a bit of your knowledge through with, you, you had very close relationships with the guys at Zip. So, yes. you know, you, you learn a lot of that, you know, spend some time in the wind tunnel there and, you know, a lot of, you know, your background and their, their background as well has, has helped to pro progress with that knowledge also. Yeah, so I, I, I make this claim that I say outside of Lance Armstrong, who was a professional triathlete for a, a short, short period that uh, I definitely have the most uh, personal wind tunnel time uh, out of any professional triathlete. And so uh, if anyone wants to challenge that, we can go through my bills and look at all the hours that I paid <laughs> in the wind tunnel, but I'm fairly certain that's correct. Awesome. All right, we'll move on to Ken. So Ken's based here in Melbourne, um, adaptive HP and become very prominent, I guess, over the, the past few years helping a lot of not only cyclists i guess that your background can mainly cyclists but a lot of triathletes now um and well-known triathletes that have gone and see you for a fit self-included um to be able to progress up through the through the ranks and obviously improve their time but also it's that that balance of comfort you know and aerodynamics as well um just give us a quick i guess recap of where you've come from and then you know what what you aim to achieve at the minute yeah, thanks, Luke. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, sports scientist, uh, also studied health science. So my, I've got a background in both sports science and health science, which I think is probably where I guess my balanced approach in, in really looking at things from both a performance perspective as well as a comfort perspective and realising that that really they both kind of have a, have a role in achieving, you know, or real performance for the athlete. So, yeah, as you mentioned, um, triathlon is not really my background. My background is actually mountain biking as a kid. Um, when I went to uni, I started road cycling and being more interested in, well, endurance performance. Um, so, yeah, progressed through uni, sports science, health science. Started working with a road cycling team that was based here in Melbourne, the Dry Pack Professional Cycling Team, which I think really gave me a taste of, of what a professional athlete has to deal with when they're, when they're putting their hours through. 
or putting their body through hours of training and then competition as well. So yeah, background, I guess, sort of led me more with a desire to, to really focus on, on position optimization and bike fitting, um, which led me to opening the business that I operate now, which is adaptive human performance with, with sync ergonomics as, as an offshoot of that being the components that are more specific to time trial performance. Oh, awesome. And then we've got Pat Legg from NRG coaching also, who also was a body therapist. Is it correct to call you a body, body therapist? Um, has worked with Triathlon Australia, the elite team, um, the Charlotte McShanes, the Aaron Denshams, um, the Fishers, the uh, Brendan Sextons of the world. So um, I think that was under John O'Hall. Um, yeah. Correct me if I'm not. Still... I guess currently, you know, you work with hands-on with age group athletes, but but also, you know, current professionals as well with um, Grace Tech as well. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I spent nearly 10 years actually with the AIS for um, uh, soft tissue massage, sports massage with, like you said, John O'Hall and uh, Sean Stevens. They were the main guys that I worked with. And then a little bit under Danielle Stefano with the VIS there as well. Um, and of course... Then none of them are working at the moment. So, <laughs> oh, actually, sorry, they are working, but yeah, no, no athletes, obviously. Yeah, and then I've, I just do a little bit of coaching myself as well. So, obviously, a few age groupers, and then, like you said, at the moment, um, Grace is as my pro athlete. Uh, I work with a few pro athletes as well, from uh, you know Craig McKenzie and uh, Ryan Cross, and then yeah, and obviously Grace. All right, and finally, we have Clint, who is probably one of, has been over the years one of the strongest, definitely one of the strongest age groupers going around in Victoria. Um, coaching currently yourself also, and has a lot to do with the the Bayside Triathlon Club here in Melbourne, one of one of the stronger clubs here around, I guess, with with a large group of athletes. Um, yeah, Clint, give us a quick history of your time in the sport as well. Yeah, it's coming up to, to 20 years um, in the sport, racing at the age group level. I've uh, been to a, f a few world championships, so I've probably raced on the same course as, as yourself and TJ, just a different wave start um, to, the, to the both of yourselves. Um, but yeah, I guess most of my training now is more at the group level, so trying to keep um, group involvement. I still do some of the personalised coaching, but a lot more at the group level. Um, and I still try the race age group, but I'm certainly nowhere near the standard I was a few years back with... Uh, work and family taking over some of my commitments. All right, if we dive straight into things, obviously it's, you know, an interesting situation at the minute. Um, and we, we've seen the rise in, in things such as swift racing and, you know, obviously the, the restrictions on what we can and can't do in different parts of the world, you know, varies. But I guess we'll start off with you, Clint, with, you know, we'll start off progress from the age group through to the, through the elites. Um, What's, I guess, probably been the main focus of, of training, um, specifically, I guess, bike work, um, and then, you know, the loads, and what have you advised, I guess, your age groupers to do during this time? Yeah, look, I, I think, firstly, my priority was trying to keep people uh, engaged in the sport um, and feeling like they actually were able to still do something and then provide them, I guess, some structure to that uh, with some sort of level of enjoyment. So some different sessions uh, that they could do, you know, a lot of people had to move to indoor training when they used to hate indoor training. Um, and people have obviously been able to, uh, less able to do longer rides. So going out for a two or three hour easy ride, there's probably been a lot uh, less restrictive or for people and, you know, it's, it's not quite as enjoyable uh, indoors by yourself. So my focus was, has been one, keeping people connected and then giving them some sessions that gives them some versatility and hopefully make indoor training a little more interesting. Um, for those that have moved to Swift, um, as a, as a great uh, way to stay motivated. I actually don't think that's too too bad for a lot of age group athletes. A lot of triathletes don't like going hard for a period of time. But if they jump on and do a swift race and go hard for 60 or 90 minutes, that's some really great training that they can do. If they enjoy that and stay motivated, I think it's, that's a really good plus. Like it's interesting you mentioned the 60 or 90 minute time frame. Um, you know, and, and obviously the trainers are a bit more specific than outdoors. Um, have you given people, say, an upper and lower limit of what they should do or are they doing similar to, to what they were doing previously? 
Yeah, look, I've tried to, to keep the range between, you know, three to four bike sessions a week that are sort of there for some people. Some people will always down at the, the two to three uh, bike sessions, somewhere up around the three to four bike sessions a week. Obviously changing the, the focus of those sessions, a bit of, you know, high cadence, you know, VO2, time trial efforts, lactate building, a bit of strength, endurance sessions, and then and a few of the threshold efforts. So probably a bit more intensity than what you do normally. But I think a lot of time people are training less. So I think it's okay to add a bit more intensity in some of those sessions. Yep. Okay, Pat, from your perspective, I guess, you know, going from, say, someone like Grace, who's been on the podium at, at most 70.3 events over the past, you know, 12 to 18 months in and around the age Pacific region, um, for sure, um, compared to the age group level you're coaching to, are there, are there any differences or... Yeah, I guess, are there any differences that you put in programs for, from one end of the spectrum to the other? Oh, certainly with Grace um, being a professional athlete, even though she does work sort of part-time and still has a little bit of physio going on, she's obviously got so much more time um, to devote to training at the moment. And with it mainly being on Zwift, she's pretty much doing, you know, seven ride sessions a week now, um, including the odd Zwift race. She's done a couple of the... Uh, I think they're called Z Pro races on Zwift. But, you know, like some ridiculous time in the morning. Um, so she's she's been... And she can sort of, you know, slot them in around the day as well. So it doesn't really matter where she's at. Whereas obviously the age group is having to slot it in. It's still around their work as most of them... Or well, most of the guys that I have still have their normal work hours. Um, but what we've found really good is that they can still... Um, even tap into some of Grace's sessions on Zwift just by setting up a, a meetup. Um, so they all meet up. They're kept together because you've got the option on Zwift to keep them together. So they can all sort of ride together and then they all just chat on um, the app Discord, which is pretty good. So it's, it's like being out on the road together in a sense. <laughs> and, um, yeah, they can still chat, still, you know, give a bit of um, slap talk to each other keep each other motivated, and then they can still do their efforts at their own pace, but they stick together on the screen, which is pretty cool that they um, get that option just to stay together, I guess. Yep, no, awesome. And then TJ, I guess from your side of things, you know, so long being one of the, definitely one of the strongest cyclists in the sport worldwide, during this time from, you know, that, that top end professional side of things and especially cycling, what sort of sessions would you be I guess, you know, doing one yourself or would other guys be doing a similar level? Uh, you know, right now I just, I, I do almost all my riding aerobic. I do one session a week where I do VO2 max intervals. And so that'll either be five by five minutes hard or six by three minutes hard with two minutes recovery. If I do five minute hard intervals, I'll do five minute recoveries. Um, and a lot of it's just the years in the sport, right? But um, I don't need more than one hard session to at this time of year to keep me in pretty good shape. And again, I'm not trying to be race ready tomorrow. I'm trying to be race ready so that I know training ready so that I know if they say in eight weeks, you got a race that I can, I can tune up and in eight weeks I can get on the start line. And so, you know, there's a fine line between burning out, training too much, training too hard right now uh, and doing absolutely nothing. And so uh, on a typical day, I, I get up in the morning and I ride on, on my rollers. I'll do a 75-minute session. Uh, I'm not on Swift. I just ride uh, aerobic. And then I prefer it right now. It's just coming into um, spring-summer season for us. So I've been able to get outside. And on the weekends, um, I'll do those intervals on the weekends, sometimes just a short ride. But sometimes I'll throw those intervals in the middle of a two, three hour. Is, three hours is the longest I'm riding right now. Uh, I don't. I don't see a lot of need for me to go out and ride five hours outside. I think. Um, I think I actually just saw a twinkle in Ken's eye when you mentioned rollers there. Um, <laughs> so Ken, just from I guess the sports science perspective, also, um, and you know, I think TJ's made some very valid points, and one that I've def definitely tried to mention to people when you when you're talking to them is you know, now is not the time to be race ready. Um, and it's about, you know, maintaining the fitness and that. But I guess, you know, the upside of Swift is 
that, you know, it, it makes it easier for people to interact and, and do some sessions. But I guess the, the flip side of it too, which it's just been interesting observing people is people are doing, you know, 100%, 100 plus percent races day in, day out. So obviously that load on the body, you know, during this stage, not, not just physically, but, you know, mentally pushing yourself that side as well. People forget the mental aspect as well. Um, now the backside of Corona, then when it comes time to race that, you know, if you're tapping into those things now, then it may leave you some or not as much for later on. Yeah. And I guess what you're talking about there is trying to periodize your, your race program around, around building in sessions that are more specific to time trial performance, right? Yep. Like trying to bring in aspects of, of the quality of your position at the right time throughout the season. Because presumably you can't focus on that, you know, all year round. You can't have, um, there's only so many things that you can focus on at once and, and you can't build all of those into a program. I think one of the, one of the things that people get lost with is the idea that you have to do endless hours on your TT bike just to get familiar with it. Um, and I think the, the, with everyone doing so many Zwift sessions at the moment, obviously that means TT bikes on ergos locked in position. And it actually gives you a really false sense of what a time trial bike feels like to ride in the real world. So I think when people go from, you know, Zwift land to, to hopefully in a few weeks time where we can get out and ride a bit more, it's, you know, probably going to be quite a different cycling experience. And yeah, when uh, TJ mentioned rollers, yeah, definitely that's uh, something that I always suggest as being a great way of, of an athlete being able to familiarize themselves with riding a time trial bike in a, uh, in a situation that's a lot more like riding it in the real world. Obviously when you ride your bike in the real world, you've got to battle against wind. You've also got to balance your bike and trying to do that while you ride in a time trial position is actually quite hard. But rollers is an excellent way of, of, of building that into your training program and, and really focusing on the quality of your position. Yep. I guess from, from that, we can progress into, you know, we, we've touched on position. So, and that, you know, on a trainer, you're holding that state position. There's no movement of the bike underneath you. There, there, there is that no real world feel. Um, as you mentioned, rollers would be the, the next, next position to, or that next step to, bridging that gap. Um, Vincent, Clint, do you, do you have any old guys, you know, try and use rollers or, you know, is there anything that you do to try and get them to change position so they're not just stuck in that, that one position all the time? Yeah, look, I think, look, most of the athletes I'm dealing with are age groupers that have come to triathlon a bit later in sport. So the progression towards rollers is probably outside of our skill set. I mean, we, we struggle to learn to swim, let alone to, <laughs> to, to, to roll. Um, but look, I, I, I try to use cadence as much as possible to, to vary some of the, the, the things they can do. Obviously, standing on a, on a stationary bike, I, I try to discourage as much as possible. Um, but I, I am trying to encourage those people to get out. We, you know, we are allowed to get out for our daily exercise. So I am encouraging people to you know, try and get on the bike and just ride that you know, once or twice a week within the, within the, the government's restrictions. And then, Leggy, like from a, I guess, a body, body therapist point of view, um, what are some of the, you know, I guess outcomes that, that would result of just, you know, day in, day out, same position for, for multiple hours. Um, there's no, you know, getting out of the seat. There's no standing up to stretch out of corners, which, you know, you do without thinking out on the road where you'll, you'll see people lock a position and it's not necessarily the same position they have on the road um, from the body point of view. What, what sort of, what does this result in? Um, well, it's, I think it's exacerbating what's already happening by people sitting at desks all day anyway. So, um, there's sort of a, there's a, I'm getting a lot of calls actually, when are you back at work? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of lower back issues out there. A lot of, they, they tend to try and lock themselves into the position, but at the same stage, it's, they're, they're turning off their core. So you turn off the core strength muscles there and and all that pressure goes onto the lower back so lots of lower back issues um and yeah that's that's what i'm seeing more of anyway at this stage yeah i guess moving on from that it you know we, we talk about positions and um over the years i guess the theories have changed or you know just as we become more knowledgeable the, the old days of the, the yarn or ricks where, you know, you slam your stem 
um, try and get as low as possible. I know, you know, from from watching, I guess, TJ over the years, you you actually ran a hot, quite high front end, you know, relative to everyone else in the time. We're talking, you know, 2008 to 2010 time, um, where the rest of us were as low as possible. Um, you actually ran quite an upper front end and you actually ran quite a high hand position. And interesting enough, which the other guys may or may not know, you know, you call them jock cups in, in America. <laughs> um, we call them boxes here in Australia that the cricketers use. You actually use them as elbow cups to, to hold you in position as well. How, one, you know, obviously there's that combination between comfort and aero, um, but then, yeah, how did you come about that position, you know, way back then? Yeah, well, I mean, that position has been around forever. Um, you know, Greg LeMond actually rode the Scott DH bars and won his first Tour de France in that position. Um, and the the whole concept of that high hands uh, and the reason the Scott DH bar was was used, right, is Scott was a ski, ski company as well, right? So it was a ski race position. And so the ski tuck, was to put your hands in front of your face to create a fairing for the rest of your body. Um, and it was probably my third or fourth time in the wind tunnel that uh, I started messing around to test that position to see if it was fast. And, and I actually had positions that were faster, but when you're looking at a position, um, you know, some of the positions you can hold in a wind tunnel for a, a, a 30 second run are unrealistic to try to hold for, you know, four plus hours in an Ironman. And so, you know, finding that position of a really fast position, good open hip angle is also really important to me. Uh, I've had three hip surgeries to replace torn labrum. So uh, opening those hips uh, became really important to me at that point in my career as well, uh, generate more power that way. Uh, and then the other kind of benefit to that, which is hard at first, but uh, it's like, Ken and, and Pat were talking about engaging the core when you're when you're riding and uh, with your hands that high uh, and that much weight forward, you actually have to engage your core just to even steer the bike. Uh, so you're leaning around to steer um, off from your core instead of um, uh, instead of just leaning on your elbows. So it's uh, yeah, it's, it was a good position. Obviously, it's it's come full circle now. It's very mainstream, especially in the in the pro ranks and now through the age group ranks. And so you don't have to have boxers anymore. There are several companies that uh, make uh, cups. I've made my own custom ones. Uh, never commercially sold them, but uh, yeah. So it's 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 definitely becoming more mainstream. And I what I'd say from all my time in the wind tunnel with a, bit, a whole bunch of athletes is. That position is not inherently faster than another position. Um, it is for some people. It is not for some people. And you don't really know unless you yourself test it out. Um, you can always do poor man's wind tunnel testing, which is on a road with a power meter using bestbikesplit.com and their weather matrix. Uh, but if you, you know, if you don't have a wind tunnel, you can still test your position and different things using Best Bike Split. Find your relative CDA. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a great position for me in terms of comfort, power, um, and longevity in the sport. Yeah. And Ken, like, the sync products have, have progressed. You know, we're, we're fast forwarding sort of 10 years now from jock cups mounted <laughs> on your bar to a more professionally made product. Um, but the, the sync products, you know, have evolved the, the high hand position. Um, and you've definitely, in your testing, I know you use the velodrome and, and check those CDAs and that. So it's for the for the general public, I guess, explain if someone went to you at Adaptive HP and said, let's try and get me as comfortable and as fast as possible, what's your process or steps through that? Yeah, so as you mentioned, we use the velodrome and we use a software package called Alpha Mantis Technologies, which was, well, a while ago purchased by Garmin, so presumably at some point in the future, Garmin will come out with an onboard CDA analysis tool that will yeah, be a, an addition to their head units. Um, so yeah, we, we measure aerodynamic efficiency or coefficient drag basically through, I guess, the rider riding around a controlled environment, which is the velodrome. Um, so I think for, for position optimization, it in, in a way works better than a wind tunnel. 
because it forces the rider to actually be on their bike for a period of time. Um, I think in the wind tunnel, you can often cheat cheat what you would actually be able to do out on the road, which I think is kind of what TJ was maybe referring to a little bit there. It's not necessarily, it's, it's hard to say that one method is better than any other method. Um, like er, error testing on the velodrome has inherent flaws that, that you just can't get around. But for, in terms of cost effective, in terms of what we can do here in Melbourne and in terms of the relevance to position optimization, that's, that's how we do it. Um, and the sync ergonomics products are, I guess, a flow on from that where I think as TJ mentioned, for him, the high hands position was far more effective than other positions. And that's what he was able to ride comfortably on the road. That's what we find as well with pretty much every athlete we test with. If the high hands position isn't more aero, it's more comfortable. So whether it's making someone more aero and more comfortable or whether it's just making someone more comfortable, um, yeah, we, we find a benefit in that and that's that's what our product has evolved from. I guess, you know, you, you talk about sport, the, the difference between that and, and cycling is, you know, a 40K time trial, you can, you know, if there's a little bit of uncomfortable pain there, you could you can probably bluff your way through it. But when, yeah, when you're talking... I disagree with that, definitely. I think even if you look at it down to a four, four kilometre individual pursuit or a yep. team pursuit, which is, I guess, the, the discipline that's similar to to triathlon or the cycling leg of triathlon on the track. So the shortest version of a time trial, you can't, you can't get around pain and discomfort. Like at some point it has an impact on your ability to hold a consistent position. And that has a huge impact on your overall aerodynamic efficiency. So whether it's a shift on the saddle once every lap of velodrome or whether it's, you know, every five minutes out on the road that you have to shift your bum during a 180 kilometer time trial, that has an impact on your aero performance. So I think, at all levels of time trialing, whether it's a four kilometer pursuit or whether it's a 180 kilometer time trial, you've got to be comfortable and you've got to be, and you can look at comfort in terms of the, the consistency of an athlete's position. And that's the way we look at it. But yeah, it's, it's really important. It, it doesn't matter whether it's four Ks or 180 Ks. You've, you've got to be comfortable and you've got to be consistent in your error position. And then we, we talk about comfort. So what would determine, I guess, the, I guess the next position we'll go we'll touch on saddle for and after and then obviously crank link which is another topic that's been quite prominent over the, the past 12 months um but say uh, the front end of an athlete front end for the athlete what what do you take into account when you're looking at something like that uh yeah so for us we've tested with a whole heap of different angles we started originally with i think it was seven and a half degrees and we've tested everything up to about 25 degrees with forearm inclination. For us, we find that basically anything over 15 degrees and the hands end up being so high that you have to lift your head so you can see. So it actually ends up being less aero. Well, everything that we've tested ends up being less aero the moment you go above 15 degrees. Anything less than 15 degrees and you don't really get the support for the forearm and upper body. So for us, it's actually pretty simple. It's 15 degrees across the board. We don't do less and we don't do more. Um, so once you've got that factor in, it's really just the case of where the position of the arm cup is, which is obviously relative to the length of the torso of the athlete, but then how long the extensions are, which is relative to the length of the forearm of the athlete. So yeah, look, for us, it's, I guess, position optimization might seem really, really complex, but when you, I guess, working with only a few variables with your equipment, it can be actually simplified quite a bit and just broken down into the anthropometric me measurements of the athlete at the end of the day. Yeah, okay. And Clint, obviously being in the sport for 20 years, have you altered, changed, or, or what things have you progressed through um, in terms of even your own bike position or what have you seen different age groupers progress from, you know, as we're talking early 2000s through to, you know, 2020, 2021 now? Yeah, look, I think it's probably similar to the stuff you were saying, Luke. Um, I think first it was all about aerodynamics and, and lower was better. Um, and, and then we, we certainly saw the, the, the sport progress. Um, and it was around probably 2009, 2012 that we probably really saw triathlon bikes developed. I think for age group athletes, we, we saw them able to get a bike that probably fitted a lot more with the population than what it used to. You know, pros were able to go and and make the adjustments they need to do to their bikes to make them the right fit for them. Um, and there you're right now in terms of the, the hand positions become a lot more. I think you're probably going to talk about crank click, 
Uh, next, which I'm again interested to hear because you know that that's going again to a, to a shorter crank length and a, and a higher cadence, which we probably saw road cycling uh, again 15 years ago go with that with that higher cadence. I guess Pat too, you know, again you come back to the the average age group in the sport is, or you know, a lot a lot of people have different jobs, but we come back to a lot of our times either sitting at a desk, sitting in a car. You know, we're we're in this position now where you you know you your hip angles are closed off, we slunch, we hunch over. How important is that, you know, comfortable bike position um, to transfer over? Well, especially with age groupers, um, a lot of age groupers are coming into the sport later on in life as well. So they haven't been through their whole sporting career where they've had lots of massage, lots of physical therapy, lots of, you know, um, all the rehab and, and all the, the things that keep your body together. So they're coming in with issues, you know, they might be, you know, coming in, having had a couple of bulge discs, they might have, um, you know, hip issues, torn, um, you know, thing, things that have gone wrong through their lives. So their, their positions can't be exactly optimised. So, yeah, we have to look at things like, um, like TJ was saying how he wants to have, to have his hip angle opened up. We look at things like that and that's where the shorter cranks come into to play and things like that. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's a completely different kettle of fish fitting or looking at the issues around a, a, an age group athlete towards a, a pro athlete, for sure. If we just do a quick run around now, I'm, I'm happy to kick it off. But, you know, back, back in the early 2000s, I said things were different to, to what they are now. I can sit here and honestly say from 2002, I think 2000, my Kona in 2005, I actually had 177.5s or 180 cranks on. Um, because back then it was longer lever. That, that was the, the theory going around. Um, it'd be interesting to see what you guys had in your earlier days on your bikes. Clint, do you, know, do you remember what you had? Oh, look, I was buying uh, bikes straight off the shelf, so I normally came with 172.5s or, or 175s, but um, I, I spent a lot of time Googling and you know, looking to try and get a, a set of you know, those 177s uh, because, yeah, the, the longer lever was, was the, the push. Pat? Yeah, I, I, the longest I ever had was 175, and I'm on 170s now. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, TJ? Yeah, so in 2008, I was with Specialized, and, you know, they had their big body geometry fit studio, and uh, they put me on 175 uh, cranks, and, you know, they had some, you know, magic box, right, that, analyze your body and you put all the inputs in and spit out, you know, ideally what you should be doing. Um, and I'm not too different than Pat. I rode 175s. I'm down on 172.5s now. Um, and that had a little aerodynamic boost with it too, because um, I didn't actually have to raise my saddle to drop the cranks to 172.5s. So um, yeah. if, uh, if you drop, if you go really short, obviously the saddle comes up and there's, there's a compromise, but it's, it's, Certainly something I've played around with a lot over the last five, six years. Yeah. And Ken, have you seen, like coming from mountain biking through to say track and now dealing with try, is there any variance in say each sport of what they use in terms of track uh, crank lengths on each? Yeah, so I guess when I started road cycling, I, I coming from the mountain bike background where crank length is typically quite long. I'm six foot tall, um, and yeah, 175 was my standard sort of crank length for ages. I'm back on 170 now. Um, there is a, yeah, it's yes and no, Luke. To, it's not an easy question to answer. <laughs> There's some people that will favour the shorter crank because they've grown up believing that that's, you know, what they need. And there's other people that have grown up believing that a long crank is what they need. I think there's a few athletes that I've worked with that have come from a pure track background where for ages even, and we're talking people shorter than six foot tall, we're running 180 mil cranks. And they have carried that through to road cycling. I wouldn't agree that that's a good way of doing it. But yeah, it's, yeah, there's people at both ends of the spectrum. Yep. And it's interesting, for, for a couple of my early years too, I was, I was coached and, and looked after by Paula Newby Fraser, who for people that don't know is won Hawaii more times than any other person at eight times, I think, off memory. Um, world record there. And playing around in her garage, and this, again, is pre-2010, and 
She had a, a, a bike there. It was uh, made by Easton with a raised bottom bracket. It was, I think it was either 26 inch, 26 inch wheels. Paul is quite short as well. But on it, I noticed she had these dangly cranks and they were, she called them drop cranks. So effectively, <laughs> it was a 170 mil crank. And then on the crank was another crank bolted on of, of 10 mil. And then on that extra bit, so it was like a three piece crank, you had your pedal. So at the top of the pedal stroke, the extra bit would come down. So it was a 160 mil crank at the top of the pedal stroke. And then at the bottom, when it was lengthened out, it was a 180 mil crank. Um, but, you know, we're talking, this is back in the 80s. So, you know, it's been interesting that people have been playing around with crank lengths and what works and, you know, opening hip angles. And Paula was very open to, I guess, experimental bike stuff and technology as well. Um, where now we see, you know, it's not uncommon. Like we talk 172.5s now is, is actually quite a long length now. Um, I think Rennie's running around 160s, um, Crowey 165s. Um, you know, I guess we'll start off, you know, with you, Ken, as, you know, you mentioned your height before and, you know, what you run. Is there any sort of correlation between crank length and height or is it, you know, is there, you know, I guess there's been a few studies done where the, there's a range where there's been no, you know, no showing power drop off between that crank length as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a correlation between your crank length and your leg length. Yep. Um, and, it, you know, crank, people, I think, look at crank length as being this, this black art of, oh, you know, it's like, well, what should I run? It's real simple. Like if you're short, you need a short crank. If you're tall, you can get away with a long crank. It's just about achieving the optimal knee joint angle and the optimal hip joint angle, which when you like our lab based services, we use motion capture technology that's pretty accurate and very reliable. And yeah, that's, that's what we work off. We work off hip joint angle and knee joint angle every time. Um, and it's just, yeah, purely a case of you need the right length crank to suit your saddle height. Uh, Clint, I guess, do, do you, with, with the age groups, you know, your coach and, your, and yourself, um, like, uh, have you played around much or do you, do you recommend them to, to now run a shorter crank off, off what's out there? Yeah, look, I think, um, look, bike for, and, and even nutrition to the same extent, look, there's a lot of science behind them. Um, but one, I'm not an expert in this field, so I can pick out people that, you know, have got their nutrition wrong, be it their daily nutrition or during a race. You know, if people are riding a bike, I can tell if you know that their seats too high, too low, uh, then their knees are sticking far out. You know, even just gearing choice, I think for age group athletes, you know, that's probably more important than that. They don't actually know how to change gears well enough. Some of some of the age groupers are coming to the sport, <laughs> so you know, I can identify these sort of things, but I do tend to leave it to experts in terms of you know bike fit, you know, hand position, crank length. But I'll certainly make recommendations in terms of who they you know they they should go and get something looked at. If I can certainly see riding with them, it doesn't look right. I guess, you know, over the years, you know, we're going from crank length and, and that changes sort of a bit of bike position as well. And the, the other thing that's been always prominent in our sport, and, and we can touch on again quickly, is, is the, the forward and after. And again, you know, starting the sport, we're riding seats, you know, six centimetres plus behind the bottom bracket um, and really closing things off as well. We're, we're, we've seen... The progression of the seat move forward. Um, I guess you know we can start with you again, TJ. Um, the seat move forward, but then now you know specifically designed time trial seats. So you know you've gone from the the traditional pointy seat to now these two pronged seats that you use your your cheekbones to sit on. And um, I guess what have you progressed in there, and what have you found over the years, TJ? Yeah, I've, I I actually had a really good discussion with uh, the guy who I use for bike fitting about this same thing. Uh, I've bounced all over the place every couple of years. I change change a saddle, and uh, his his best explanation to me about why it happens was he said, uh, you know, humans. It really comes down to humans are not meant to spend this much time on a bike saddle, um, and so after you do it for a couple of years, you basically. Um, he said every time you ride your bike, you're basically like creating a scab, uh, and he said if you ride too frequently, he said you never give that scab time to heal. And eventually, over a long period of time, that scab starts to cause problems. And it's best to just start with a new shape that you can you can get so you're not on the same pressure points, right? So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've switched from, uh, I rode on the same side you rode probably for a long time, right? The Physique Arion uh, was probably the most popular trap on saddle. Uh, I like narrow saddles, so I, I spent several years riding a, um, uh, well, I was a specialized, so I rode their saddles for a while. Um, and they kind of had a mix of a short saddle that was narrow. Uh, and then I rode uh, Cell Italia Iron Flow, which is a short nose, you know, two piece saddle. Um, and actually, right now, I've been riding, again, I'm riding more on my road now than I do on my, my TT bike, but I'm back on a Shimano Pro uh, full length saddle. Um, right. But again, with a cutout in the middle. I don't think. I don't think I've been on a saddle without a cutout um, in a very long time. Yeah, I guess Pat too, you know, over the years, and again, coming back to how the, how the body works and that, do you, have you got a preference over recommending one type of saddle as another, or even, you know, male and female prefer different seats as well? Oh, look, saddles are uh, the rabbit hole of, the cycling industry, I reckon. Um, no, it's, it's, it's really difficult. It, you think you land on, on one that's really good for females or males or whatever, and then it gets all thrown out the window with the next six people that you see, you know. Um, and I, I think, you know, the best shops and fitters and everything have a, have a like I was actually looking at um, Ben Williams the other day, who's got the um, Hawaii Triathlon Centre. Um, bike shop and he had a wall of test saddles and I think that's just the best way to go you know you've just got to have that um, amount of saddles um, yeah certainly I think uh, the shorter nose and the and the, and the split um, saddles have been great you know but you know I, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for someone else you know I'm riding on an SMP saddle um, T5 at the moment which I love but you know that might not be great for someone else but um, I think just going back to what you were talking about just before with the, how the bikes have changed over the years, that's one thing I've found with, with, especially with age group athletes, is is convincing them that, you know, just because they're uncomfortable in the aero position on a road bike doesn't mean they're going to be uncomfortable on a tri bike. Um, and it's, it's amazing just how many, once they step up to having a time trial or a tri bike, um, just how much more comfortable they are and they, they can just go for so much longer in that aero position. So I think, yeah, what, first step is getting them into that, you know, the, the good position, obviously, but yeah, onto a tri bike and then, yeah, and then working on saddles from there. It's just, a, it's a minefield. Yeah, so, and Ken too, I know, you know, seeing you myself and that too, we talked about different saddles and then, you know, allowing the pelvis to, to get into the correct position. Um, what's your, I guess, the, the difference you see between, the typical, the typical, we'll call it a typical road saddle, um, the traditional long, whether it be a physique or own, um, to, you know, the uh, ISMs or SMPs sorts of, sorts of designs. Yeah, a, a few things there. And I think if we could maybe just backtrack for a second to your original sort of comment about saddle position, saddle four off position. I think, yeah, maybe what's changed over the last few years is saddle four off position a little bit, but that's not, necessarily changing where the athlete sits over the bike it just changes where the saddle is positioned under the athlete so when you look at a seat like say for example an ism saddle which is a short nose and a cutout and you want the athlete to be sitting in a really specific spot on that saddle so saddle four aft position is really really important if you look at a saddle like what you said you used to ride and i think what tj mentioned he used to ride as well the physique Ariane Tri Saddle, which is a really narrow seat. It's got quite a long nose, quite a slender nose that's almost the same profile for a good sort of 70, 80 mils. So in a way, your saddle four aft position with, with that seat is maybe not quite as important as it is with an ISM saddle because you just end up positioning yourself at a different point on the nose of the seat. That's, look, personally, I wouldn't use that sort of saddle for triathlon, but... Um, yeah, there, there are plenty of people that still use those sorts of seats. In terms of saddle choice and how I look at it, it's a simple case of supporting the position that the spine needs to be in on the bike. You don't really want to see someone sitting in excessive lumbar and thoracic flexion. And I think there's been a few comments throughout this, uh, this little video of, of, of back pain and, and, and um, in triathlon. And yeah, that is one of the most, most common injuries about... 70% of triathletes will experience back pain throughout their, their sort of life within the sport. 
So that's the, one of the most important considerations when it comes to saddle choice. So the only way you can really manipulate um, the flexion loading of the spine is, is seat choice and anterior pelvic tilt on the saddle. And the ISM saddle or a saddle that has a really large cutout and a really broad nose is basically the only way that you can anteriorly tilt the pelvis sitting on a seat. And that has a flow and effect of well of supporting aero positioning because obviously we want the torso within reason as low as possible. Yep, okay. Clint, over the years too, what have you changed your, I guess, fore after saddle choice as you progress through the sports? Uh, yeah, like I, I actually had the same physique as well. Um, and I, I actually sold my tri bike um, uh, and then was out of, out of the tri bike for about seven or eight months and then actually went and bought the exact same frame again um, and went and got a, a new setup. Um, probably my first full setup in maybe four or five years. And I guess I probably followed some of the, the philosophies that Ken's talked about there with, with the saddle choice. Um, I've, my hands are definitely higher up in terms of what you know, TJ was talking about earlier. Um, and the, the cleat position, I've also, I'm also toying with the cleat position at the moment, uh, where previously I was just, you know, the old school approach with, you know, knuckle of the, the foot uh, next to the, to the uh, crank length. Now that's sort of changing a bit. What's your view on cleat position? We'll start with TJ. I haven't changed my cleat position at all. I run really neutral. Um, the only the only thing that I would say that I've changed is uh, I like less float on my cleats now than I did when I first started. Um, I don't want my I just don't like my feet moving, um, and so I'm real particular about the exact placement of the cleats. But I run a true neutral, so I I, I use CD cycling shoes and I put it in the exact middle of of the cleat positioning system, not midfoot place, but in the exact middle of the um, of the cleat holes. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I use. It stayed exactly the same. And where I used to prefer a, a cleat with more float, um, I actually, in daily training now, I'll use a, a, a two and a half degree float or a zero float on a regular basis, just so the foot doesn't move at all. Yeah, and you, you still on look cleats or look pedals? Yeah, still on yep. look, yep. Yeah, Clint, just out of interest, what, what pedal cleat do you run? Shimano. Shimano. All right, Leggy, you know, obviously as well, um, there's been different things come out over the over the time. You know, you look at Fredino, um, I think Danielle Arif at certain stages, I can't can't clarify whether she still does, but they definitely ran a cleat position and, and generally some custom bolted holes towards definitely towards the middle of the shoe. It's definitely well and truly past that normal neutral would talk about. Um, I guess, what's your view on, you know, whether it be ankle flexion or tightness or, or everything else on, on the cleat position? Well, the, the guys I see at the clinic, whenever we look at cleat position, it's generally because they've got a degenerative issue or something like that. And they need, um, they need some sort of different angles on their cleats just to relieve that pressure um, more so than anything. I mean, most, it's generally leave that, for the more experienced um, professional bike fitters to to play with, um, but um, I don't see many of those sort of midfoot positions like Daniel. Obviously, it's just not that accessible to to try uh, to to your normal age group, but, you know, because they don't have the access to the um, to the technology. I guess um, I, I, there is a brand out there that makes a custom shoe with a midfoot cleat. I can't remember. One of my clients did have them. Um, and that was, that was, I think he would got them, was it Achilles injuries? Ken might know a bit more about that, why he would have got those, but it was, yeah, it was, um, I, I'm pretty sure it was because he had persistent Achilles injuries. He got them. Um, but I, honestly, I can't remember the brand that, that he got. To be honest. Yeah. And, and you're, you're on speed play and have been for a while. Yep. Yeah. I've been on speed play since, uh, I think 2000. I got them back when I was living in Japan, um, after a bike crash where I had uh, some uh, just reoccurring bad knee injuries and they, they fixed them up and I've just stuck with them ever since. Yeah, that, and that's back in the day, pre-adjustability and pretty much yeah, yeah, two bars of smoke in the shower and sliding around. <laughs> yeah, they were, I think they were called Speed Play X back then, maybe. 
I think that's what they were. Yeah, yeah they're the ones. So again, you know, obviously going on from, from Pat then too, is there any reason, and, and again, it'd be interesting to hear your view, you know, obviously in terms of triathlon side of things too, but, you know, I guess track cyclists you might use a, a different thing to a pursuer. So I'm not sure from road, like, is there any variation across the board or is there, you know, something you'd recommend or, and again, too, you look at the difference between, say, a speed play pedal, you know, which obviously is around this big and then, I guess the most common pedal in Australia would be the Shimano's where your base of support's quite large as well. But then, you know, carbon soles and that as well. Um, does that eliminate that? Yeah, obviously a whole heap of questions yeah. there. Um, yeah. So I guess first and foremost, uh, moving the cleat more rearward on the shoe. The idea behind doing that is to reduce the load that you put on your um, calf muscles, which uh, I guess conceptually it makes sense. And there is actually some evidence to support that it does work. You wouldn't necessarily do it for a cyclist. You wouldn't do it for a discipline where you have these really large sort of changes in exercise intensity, such as track cycling and road cycling. Because basically any time where you have to really jump on the pedals and, and do an acceleration, that's where you need the mechanical advantage that comes from crank length or it comes from your cleat placement on the shoe. So it is different for different disciplines. Um, I think with triathlon, you can get away with positioning the cleat more rearward on the shoe because you don't have those accelerations that need to be made or not to the same extent that you're doing road cycling and track cycling. Um, there, I think there is, and some of the research that I've read does show that running performance improves a little bit if you move the cleat a little bit more rearward on the shoe. However, I think the populations that they do that research with don't necessarily represent elite athletes. So... I guess my, my concern with going down that path of a rearward cleat placement is I don't believe there's the research out there that supports it um, because I believe that an elite athlete will be able to cope with the cleat being positioned in a more neutral or more normal position, similar to what we use in road and track cycling. Um, in terms of the difference in the types of pedal systems out there, I think it all relates back to what's a functional system for a long period of time. I think my biggest concern with speed play and the thing that I don't like about speed play pedals is they wear out really quickly and they end up with a lot of rocking. So um, to me, that's a big downside because you, you want a consistent foot position. And I know TJ mentioned that he likes to have cleats with no or minimal float. That's great when your foot's in, a, um, in, a, in its neutral position or when you've been able to identify the position that the foot needs to be supported in. But when you've got a speed play pedal and you, and you do that, you might have a good position for a week and then all of a sudden something wears out or wears, wears in and your foot's in a totally different position. So look, um, are in a similar sort of boat to speed play. They wear out really prematurely. So, yeah, my preference is Shimano every time. And that's I'm not a Shimano advocate by any stretch of whatever. But in terms of promoting a consistent, stable foot position, I love the Shimano pedal system and the blue cleats. And then, yeah, a blue cleats. Okay, I was, that's what I was about to follow on. Do you prefer red, blue, yellow? Yep, yeah, okay, so blue, so a little bit of movement. Yeah, I don't think there's really much of a place for red cleats these days. Maybe if you're a track sprinter and you're strapping your feet into your pedals anyway, sure, you, you're not going to get any movement, so why not use a red cleat? Yellow, yeah, I don't ever use it in my own services. I'm always using blue. But I think the other thing that's really important there is having an insole in your shoe, so something that supports the neutral position of your foot. Because if your foot's moving around in the shoe, that's going to translate to movement of the foot over the pedal, which needs to be catered for. So I think you can only really optimise the pedal interface when you have a supportive insole that's built for the shape of your foot. Okay, TJ, Ken, Pat, Clint, thank you again for your time, your expert knowledge in your fields, and just generally coming on and having a chat for Triathlon Victoria. I know the, the general public through from the, you know, the new age group to the coaches, you know, to, to the top end professional, love talking about this stuff, love hearing about this stuff, and we'll, we'll find something quite knowledgeable out of this. We will put links up on the Triathlon website where if you wish to ask any further questions or get in touch with anyone, then you can reach out to them directly. Again, thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of your week.